you joining us in person and those of you joining us online. Welcome to the Teller's End of the Semester Showcase. Live storytelling is finally back. Woo! <laughs> Teller's Showcase has been a tradition for 10 years now, and we are so excited to have you all join us. Please take a moment and take any electronic devices you may have and that emit light or sound and turn them off. They can be very distracting to the people around you. This show will run just under an hour with no intermission. Even though we're outdoors, please plan to remain seated for the entire performance. If you like what you see tonight, feel free to visit the TPS website for more information on our production season. But in the meantime, please enjoy the, the Teller's End of the Semester Showcase. I approached the building and the automatic doors slide open before me, beckoning me in in a creepy kind of way. I walk in and, God, there's just something about fluorescent lights that really sets me on edge. It paints the room in this weird off-blue color that looks like something you'd see in a really bad student film that's trying really hard to be artsy. I make my way over to the break room, and I swear it's like they designed those things to be as uncomfortable as possible. It's like they want you to go back to work or something. I make my way over to the mirror in the corner of the room, check myself before I have to go back out there. Green polo, check. Black slacks and apron, double check. Name tag, Jacob, check. I look in the mirror and give my best customer service smile. Man, I hate my job. There comes a time in every young adult's life where you just kind of end up getting sick of your parents' shit. Whether that's a need for more space, or they don't respect your boundaries, or they don't understand that you like to take hour-long showers, which is completely fine, and they're totally comfortable. And I'm not doing what you think I'm doing in there, Mom, I swear. That's gross. <laughs> anyway, it's basically inevitable that at a certain point, you're just gonna end up leaving the nest and becoming your own person, an independent adult, if you will. I was a little bit behind the curve in that regard, I guess, because I was a baby bird until I was 21. I am really good, though, at making really important life decisions at the worst possible times. By the time I moved out, it was May of 2020. And you all remember May of 2020, 10 years ago. <laughs> I didn't let the pandemic slow me down, even though I'd been planning for so long because I wanted to taste adulthood before society as I knew it effectively collapsed. But in order to do that successfully, I needed to make preparations. I needed to be able to pay my bills, so I looked for jobs. I mean, after all, if you really think about it, there is nothing more adult than getting crushed under the great big boot of capitalism. So I applied to a bunch of different places. I applied to Target, I applied to Walmart, I, Applied to CVS. I'm, I'm not really proud of that. I needed a job, okay? And none of them wanted me. And I, I like to think I'm a pretty smart guy, or at least I'm a hard worker, so, you know, they're lost. So I applied to Costco, and I applied to Publix, and Walgreens, and none of them wanted me either. They didn't care about my slamming resume. They, they didn't care that I learned to read chapter books when I was six or that I am a superlative pianist, or that I won a silver medal in a fencing tournament when I was 11, but I started crying because I lost to my arch nemesis, Ethan. <laughs> they didn't care about any of that. One day, while I was in my room sulking and contemplating my life's decisions up to that point, I received a phone call, and it was from Publix, where shopping is a pleasure. And they wanted me to come in for an interview. This is perfect. They wanted me. They really, really wanted me. And I was so overwhelmed by the euphoria of being desired by the hiring authority of a corporate entity that I didn't even notice that in the interview they were basically just checking to see if I had a pulse. But I did get the job because I do have a pulse. <laughs> a 
few days later, they brought me into this really dingy room in the back of the store and sat me down at this computer that was older than I was, and I had to watch some training videos. I watched this video about the history of Publix, and I learned a little bit about the founder, George Jenkins, the father of Publix, but people called him Mr. George. And then after that, I watched some videos of employees interacting with customers, and all the employees looked really happy to be there, and all the customers were really nice. I think I could get used to this job. This is pretty cool. The thing they don't tell you, though, is that none of your coworkers out there are going to be as happy as the employees in the videos, and none of the customers are going to be as nice, or as good looking, if I'm being honest. But I didn't care about any of that. I was bleeding green with pride to be working at Publix. I was finally a part of something. I was part of the Publix family. But I was so busy bleeding green that I didn't even notice all the red flags around me. There are certain aspects of retail that when you tell other people who've never done retail about them, it kind of makes everything sound a little bit like a cult. I was so hyped to be a part of the Publix family that I didn't even really think about the fact that there are plenty of groups that tend to frame themselves as families that aren't even actually that good of people. Like the Mansons, <laughs> or the Mafia, or, or K-pop fans, I don't know. I know where you live, but you're awesome. I mean, Sorry. <laughs> anyway, on top of that, Everyone was so obsessed with George Jenkins. They called him Mr. George so lovingly. Everyone wanted to climb the corporate ladder and be the next Mr. George. And in the middle of shifts, people would ask themselves, oh, what would Mr. George do? As if Mr. George rose from the dead three days after he died. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> and then there was this weird dynasty system going on in Publix. There, were, there was the overarching Publix family but then there were families within Publix. I had entire families as my coworkers at Publix. Fathers, mothers, sisters, and brothers, all working at the same Publix, all at the same time, even carpooling to work together. And then, if I didn't have to deal with that, I would be bagging groceries, and I would have customers come up to the cashier and me and say, oh, this Publix is so nice. It's so much nicer than my Publix. And it's even bigger than the Publix that my husband works at. And I would just smile while I bagged the groceries when really I was thinking, lady, it's a grocery store. You can relax. <laughs> and then there was David. David was this short middle-aged guy who prowled around the aisles of Publix pretending to do work when he actually wasn't and everyone knew it. And if there was one other thing that everyone knew about David, it was that David was completely miserable. Every day I would try and talk to David and say, hey David, how you doing? And he would just look at me and say. As far as anyone could tell, David didn't really have much, much going on. He still lived with his parents, that was apparent, but he didn't really have a wife or children to speak of. But the thing that really messed me up about David was the fact that David started working at that exact Publix, in that exact position, 25 years ago. The same position that I got hired into three months before. And then on top of that, David started working at Publix, like me, when he was 21. And, and from that moment on, David kind of became this creepy mirror to a future that I knew I didn't want with Publix. I knew I needed to get out of there at some point, or otherwise it would consume me too. But I bided my time a little bit. The last straw came when I was sitting in the break room one day, scrolling through Facebook, trying to savor the last few moments of freedom I had before I had to go back out there for eight hours, and suddenly a coworker ran in crying, and she was followed by another coworker who came in to console her. And I'd already read everything that there was to read on Facebook that was worthwhile, which is to say, nothing. So I decided to listen in on their gossip. And uh, as it turns out, her husband is a store manager at another Publix. And he's having an affair with a woman who works at another Publix in the meat department, if you know what I mean. <laughs> Ew! 
place is nasty. Everything is so, ugh. I knew I didn't want to be a part of this establishment anymore. I needed to get out of here and fast because I didn't want my life to be anywhere near as absorbed in Publix as these people. So I knew I needed to quit. But I felt kind of bad for wanting to quit Publix. Like I was letting everyone down. Like I was betraying the Publix family or Mr. George. Everyone was so concerned with sticking to Publix because it's such a great place to work. Why, why didn't I feel that way? Am I just a bad worker? Am I lazy? Am I stupid? And what, what would I have without Publix anyway at this point? I've spent the past few months, all of my waking hours have gone into that. I didn't have time to see family or friends or to take hour-long showers anymore. <laughs> hey, that's gross. Stop it. <laughs> Finally, after weeks of agonizing, I did it. I went to my manager Juan's office and I turned in my two weeks and he looked up at me from the desk and said, you're such a great worker. Why are you quitting? And I just said, I, I, it's, I need some time for my family. It, it's been a rough few months. I, I might be back. I knew I wasn't actually going to be back, though. I just lied to, you know, lighten the blow a little bit. And that was it. On my last day working at Publix, I was talking to one of my coworkers before I left, and she asked me why I was quitting. I gave her the same spiel I gave Juan, basically just saying the same things. And after I was done, she nodded in understanding. And then she started laughing. And she said, oh. I thought you were quitting because of something stupid, like school. <laughs> I walked toward the automatic sliding doors and they opened for me, beckoning me into freedom this time. And I walked into the parking lot and turned to look at the giant green public sign that overlooked the entire place. I'm not trying to disparage grocery store workers or something like that with this story. Grocery store workers are really important. I mean, think about it. Without them, we would all kind of starve. But what I do have an issue with are companies like Publix that rather than, you know, paying their employees a proper wage, they'd rather instill this sense of meaning in them through a family structure, when in reality, they're actually just as disposable as any other employee. And until businesses get better about that, Every day, I'm just going to keep passing Publix on my way here, or home, or anywhere else. And I'm going to look at it and say, yep, that's a cult. <laughs> Jacob Segura, everybody, one more time. <laughs> Jacob is a senior. He's a double major, so he's going to graduate next December. Uh, he's incredibly smart, incredibly talented, as you can see. And you just, he's a big teddy bear. You just kind of want to put your cheeks, but you don't for reasons that are outlined in the university's COVID policy and the faculty handbook. <clears throat> my name is Dr. Charles Parrott. I'm the director of the KSU Tellers. It is my great pleasure to welcome you here tonight, and that is your cue to applaud again. <laughs> tonight, you're going to see five more stories from the KSU Tellers uh, in a similar mold. Um, these stories are all coming of age stories because, well, frankly, that's all these people have ever done. Um, I gave all these folks, when we started preparing for the show, I gave these folks one direction, which was simply this. Um, this is your chance, for the first time in a long time, to get up in front of real, actual human people and talk to them and tell them something. And given the world as it goes, uh, we don't know when that might happen again. So what do you want to say? And that's what they all decided, and that's the show that you're going to see here tonight. Now, I've, yeah, somebody's applauding. I'm into that. I'm into that. I'm applauding. I'm getting a little emotional because this is the first time we've had a showcase in like three semesters, and um, I'm just really excited to be here with you. And I'm excited to introduce our next performer. Our next performer is Megan Collins, and I've known Megan for a very long time. Back a long time ago, I used to have advisees, and Megan was my advisee. And Megan has been in um, a show that I directed, and now Megan's in television. Megan's in all three of the classes I'm teaching this semester, which con is confusing for both of us. 
Uh, but it's delightful because he's the kind of student you want to see in your class every day. Ladies and gentlemen, Megan Collins. When I was 12, I had a vision. I had to spend most of my time in my room, so I wanted it to be beautiful. And what's more beautiful than pink walls with zebra print everything? Now, I wasn't really allowed to ask for things without a good reason, so when Christmas rolled around and my mom asked me what I wanted, it was the time. So I asked her for pink walls with zebra print everything. And she gave it to me. Three years later. So as a new high schooler walking into this room and looking around, I realized that pink with zebra print everything is not cute. <laughs> but my mom spent a lot of money on this, so I had to pretend like I liked it. And there I go again, pretending to be perfect and like everything was okay. Now, my mom is really smart. No, seriously, like an actual rocket scientist. And school has always been the most important thing to her. She wanted to teach me all the things because she had all the answers. She was gonna make me brilliantly smart and super independent. She was gonna make me the best Megan she could. And so began the homeschooling. Now, I had two problems. One, I had a slight lisp, which in her mind meant that I didn't sound smart. And two, I'm dyslexic with a slight processing delay. But if you work hard enough, Megan, you can fix yourself. So I'd be sent to my room to train and do schoolwork. I did spelling exercises where any word that I spelled wrong, I had to rewrite 30 times in spelling triangles. I did reading passages where I had to pronounce every word specifically. And if I messed up, I had to restart from the beginning until I got three times through it without messing up. I did writing exercises where I had to come up with these crazy creative stories. And that was, of course, to feed my creative side. And this is all fine. It's all educational. But I didn't go outside. I didn't leave my room. And all of this work took me forever. I just felt so squeezed. And my mom would freak out if I ever made a mistake. I felt like I was playing the role of this like genius kid or something. And by the time I made it to public school and through to my senior year in high school, it seemed like nobody really knew what was going on with me. Did anyone know that I spent day and night to try to become this perfect student? Did anyone know that I pushed myself to the point of vomiting in between my classes? I mean, my mom knew. And she would always say, you gotta push through it. Failure is not an option. You're too smart for that. My mom is a rocket scientist and she has all the answers. So of course, it is incredibly frustrating when I don't have the answers. I always felt guilty. Like, I would feel guilty if I left my room to go get food or if I went to sleep. I just always felt like there was never enough time and that I would run out of time before I had any answers that were good enough. But I had to act like everything was okay. Now, by the time I got to high school, my acting career had gotten serious. <laughs> I remember my senior year of high school, we were rehearsing for the show called Eurydice by Sarah Rule. It's amazing, you guys should totally go check it out. And so I'm playing Eurydice and my best friend, who's a freshman, is playing my father. Because high school, you know? And so we're setting up for the top of the scene, scripts in hand, walking up onto the stage. And let me break it down for you. So Eurydice, that's me, has lost all of her memories. And her father, the freshman, is reteaching her how to read and write. And as the lines go on, Eurydice gets more and more confused. And her father says, it's okay. It's okay not to have the answers. And something inside me snapped. 
You see, when you're performing, you're opening yourself up to this vulnerability that can be incredibly fragile. And it's not okay not to have the answers. Because if it was okay not to have the answers, then I wouldn't have spent all those nights studying. Then I wouldn't have stayed in my room all day, never going outside and pushing myself to being sick. And this freshman is probably, he's probably right. But for me, when he said, it's okay not to have the answers, I looked at him and I just, lost it. I'm sorry. It's okay? It's okay not to have the answers? You mean I don't have to go back to my room and learn all this right now? And so as I'm sitting there crying, my best friend and my director are looking at me wondering what's going on. But until that rehearsal, no one had ever told me that it was okay not to have the answers. The show opened uh, right before Christmas break, and I was so excited. And not just because it was show night, but also because my mom was gonna come see me for the first time. Now, considering how I've been acting, dancing, performing since I was seven, this might be a little bit hard to believe, but she would take me to the rehearsals or shows, drop me off, and then leave. You've gotta go out of your way to miss that many performances. But this time she was coming and gonna stay for the whole show. So the show takes off and I am feeling great about my delivery and it's very emotionally driven. I, I actually still remember part of it. His eyes were like two black birds and they flew to me. And I said, no, stay where you are. He needs you in order to see. At the end of the show, I got a standing ovation. And now I know for a high school theater show, that might be a pretty common occurrence, but it was a huge moment for me. And after the show, I went to go see my family and my sister had this crazy wild look on her face. And I'm like, what's going on? And she pulls me to the side and she says, you're never gonna believe this. But mom cried. Mom cried like a lot. <laughs> what? It would be great for this story if I could tell you that after that, me and my mom got along, but we didn't. And I wish I could tell you that we had some epic blowout, but we didn't. And I wish I could say that I we hiked up Kennesaw Mountain, and as the sun was setting, with the light streaming on my face, that it spoke to me, and I realized I don't have to be anything for anyone else, and that it was all clear. But I didn't. It's a day-to-day -day process of deciding who I want to be, of waking up and leaving my room, of accepting all of me, of being okay with no need of approval and being okay with not knowing. I don't know why my mom is the way she is. I have to imagine that she was just trying to do what's best for me. But in the process of doing that, she didn't realize how much I was suffering. It was hard. And I suffered a lot. But I can't be defined by the person she thought I should be. And truth is, she never knew the real me or listened to what I wanted to do in life. I remember standing in that pink, zebra-filled room, packing up everything for college that wasn't pink or zebra print and standing there alone saying, I will never be stuck in this room again. I was off to experience the world, the colors, the patterns, the freedom. But I might skip over the pink and zebra print stuff though. 
I had enough of that. Okay, real quick, did everybody else see some students stealing furniture out of the social science building, or did somebody microdose me with LSD? Okay, because that's, that's, okay, that's what I saw. Anyway, um, <laughs> Megan, Meg, well, it was, it was weird. See, they're, they're doing it over there, it's weird. Um, <laughs> what was I gonna say? Oh yeah, I wanted to give a real quick shout out to the bees. Can we give <laughs> When we were gonna do this show, um, they asked me, you know, what kind of technical requirements do you have? And I said, we just need some mics and a few lights, and could you get us some bees? <laughs> it's turned out to be really good. I like the bee jokes, nobody else does. That's fine, <laughs> it's not for everybody, it's fine. Um, here in the Department of Theater and Performance Studies, we conceive ourselves to be scholar artists, and that means we make art that's about stuff and helps us unpack the human experience, and I think you're gonna see that unfolding across all these stories tonight. Um, we are such so good at the scholar artist thing. We've done something like 22 events this month. Is that close, something like that, yeah? Uh, Kylie Talbot has been in all of those events. Um, <laughs> Kylie is involved in KISS and in the musical theater ensemble and the musical theater other student group, and um, Kylie Talbot uh, sweeps sometimes. Um, she has been on the crew for uh, Thumbelina this semester um, and is in Casey Tellers. And tonight, right here, you're seeing Kylie's last show. So this is Kylie Talbot. Being a freshman in college is like, it's like, Okay, so you're a baby giraffe falling seven feet from your mother's womb. And then you have to immediately get up and haul ass because there's danger lurking everywhere even though you're only five seconds old. So, there I was, first couple of days of classes stumbling around because I am a baby giraffe. And I tried really hard to make sure that I was not perceived as the prey, but I failed. Everyone knew that I was a freshman. But really, starting college is extremely terrifying. There you go, tossed away from everything. That's familiar. You have free time, but you don't. You have money to spend, but you don't. You have a very limited time frame where you have to make friends, or else you're stuck rotting away in your dorm room with furniture that doesn't even match. <laughs> Thankfully, within two weeks, I caught sight of another group of stumbling, bumbling baby giraffes. I said, oh, you're just like me. Let's stumble around together. And we connected scarily fast. And maybe that was because of my Pikachu impression. <clears throat> Pika, be. But whatever, we, one day we went from stumbling all across campus to el elegantly galloping across campus. We felt so powerful to have this sort of friend group. We were funny, we were dumb, we were theater majors. We even went so far as to call ourselves the Kenna Sluts. What is a slut? It's like a term used for women who have lots of sex and it's not a nice term. We were theater majors. <laughs> we, the kind of sluts consisted of, that's not necessarily important right now. All you need to know is that this is the friend group you have as a college freshman. The safety blanket group. Our first months of friendship was an absolute dream. We held horror movie nights, <gasps> and we tried and failed to go clubbing at the Electric Cowboy, and we tried and failed to, to do drinking. <laughs> Since we were all characters in a coming-of-age film, it was finally time for us to take the once-in-a-lifetime spring break trip our destination, Lake Rabin, Georgia, 
parentheses, Kennesaw Alex's grandparents' mountain house, double parentheses, his entire family was going to be there. <laughs> Our mission, become God? TBD, um, we, I don't think we could have became God with a whole family on campus, so. On our journey over, all signs of normal humanity disappeared and the asphalt underneath our tires was quick, quickly replaced by rocks and the dust that puffed up from the pressure of the tires was definitely clogging our tracheas, but we still kept the windows down because we wanted to smell this real, raw, fresh mountain air. Suddenly, the trees parted and I was left looking at the bluest water I had ever seen. I hung half my body out the passenger side window in all of my golden retriever glory, watching with a parted mouth as all the new wilderness pieces came. Squirrel, rock, tree, water, squirrel. This was it. This was the time where we were going to ascend to a higher level of friendship. It was early afternoon by the time we arrived to the mountain home of <coughs> Grammy and Pa. <laughs> Our cars wheezed up their steep mountainous driveway until we parked. And then the adrenaline hit us. We climbed our beds, we threw our stuff down, and we were ready to start the tour of the territory, which Kenneth Slut Alex led. First, he took us through the extravagant mountain house itself, and as I looked around, I was starting to wonder if Pa had stolen the Declaration of Independence. <laughs> and then Alex took us down to the actual lake house, and immediately, for some reason, we all wanted to shove our hands in the water, even though it was definitely pricking our skin. And eventually, that led to us daring each other to jump in. Only one of us did, and he was quite miserable after the fact. But it was super cool. We watched as his silhouette hurled itself into the cold, dark water, and we held our breath. And we also filmed everything on Snapchat because we wanted to make sure everyone knew we were having fun. <laughs> the bedrooms were split between the ladies and men, as Pa had called it. He deemed us women passing people as dainty. <laughs> Alex, make sure the ladies know that there's no bathroom on the boat. <laughs> make sure you help the ladies onto the boat. <laughs> Men, make sure you help the ladies get their seconds for dinner. So what, women just pee everywhere and fall around? Okay, sometimes, maybe, but step off, Pa. Kenneth Slut, Beth, and I were already on our third helping of steak that night. Jeez. Our nights were spent in the basement. We watched movies together. We took Polaroid pictures and named one of them the family portraits. Friendship bracelets were also made and I made sure to tie mine securely around my wrist because this meant how real our friendship was. Eventually, the trip started to wind down and we started reviewing the highlights of the trip like it was some late night ESPN special. Right, when Alyssa and Chris fell off the tube and into the freezing cold water, Alyssa, how are your bones? <laughs> um, actually, I have to stop you there. When Kylie got ill from the s'mores, Wait a second, well, I think we're forgetting when, when, when Jess thought that they killed Coco. You remember that, Jess? <laughs> Jess did not, in fact, kill Coco the dog. Coco remained alive the entire time, and I think Coco is still alive. <laughs> Eventually, our reviews took us underneath the night sky and the stars had shown brighter than I had ever seen them before. From our position overlooking the lake, it looked like there were two night skies and we were just sandwiched between them like little star kids with so much life to live. A bonfire we used to life and it warmed the tips of our fingers and our toes. 
And I looked around at the summer camp-esque seating formation we were in, and I allowed a whole new warmth to take over me. This warmth was just with genuine love and affection and adoration towards these people sitting around me. And I think in that moment, we all felt the same warmth. There was a stillness to the night that was simply conducted by the flames licking the sky and the occasional crackling. We were so excited to go through our college future together, the adventures of the Kenneth Sluts, and we hoped for more adventures exactly like this one, with the fire by the lake. We aren't friends anymore. And I know it sounds kind of harsh when I put it like that, and in the moment, watching them all dissolve away from me, it was very harsh, but that's part of life. People seem to think that when things end, something went wrong, and that just wasn't the case. They were the safety blanket group that protected me from diving into the real college sea. Some of them, left without smiles to spare, that's life too. And I don't really blame anyone for leaving. They found themselves before the rest of us did and sought other groups that would help them blossom into true adulthood. That friendship bracelet I made, I had it on for three full years. And I was always so afraid to cut it off because if I did, that meant everything was over. Last semester, I cut it off, inhaled, exhaled, nothing happened. The only thing that still remains is the warmth of the memories that I had with the Kenneth Sluts, with the fire by the lake. And I will forever thank the Kenneth Sluts for that. Kylie Talbot, everybody. Hey, Jess. It's fun when somebody in the story, you know, is here. That's great. Um, I always contend that all stories and all the stories that we tell, uh, several of you are here, yeah, uh, um, are about the same thing, which is all stories are about the same thing, which is what does it mean to be a person? And that's also the central question of the humanities. Um, these coming of age kinds of stories are fantastic in part because they help you evoke some of those memories and thoughts of your own. If you're no longer coming of age and you're like me and you're just aged, um, <laughs> that helps you kind of remember those experiences. And if you're still coming of age, you can hearken back to like this morning and, and think about <laughs> what it was like growing up. Um, uh, Ira Idol is a wonderful, warm presence and quite funny, and everything I want to tell you about Ira would might be a spoiler for the story. So I'm going to let him tell it. This is Ira Idol. I'm in an elevator in a Marriott hotel in Washington, D.C. And once the elevator reached the bottom floor, the doors opened, I stepped out, and that's where the magic began. There was a big banner that said, Welcome to the 2019 Autistic Self-Advocacy Network ASAN Gala. I was there to meet people just like me and to see just what was possible. I went up to the front desk, checked in, and then looked around to see if there was anyone I noticed. Oh, Samantha Crane, an autistic Jewish lesbian Harvard Law School graduate and the legal director of ASAN. How cool is that? I went up and introduced myself to her. Hi, I'm Ira, it's nice to meet you. Hi, Ira, I'm Sam, nice to meet you. And then we started to have a conversation and we were bonding really quickly. I'm in, I'm three years old and I'm in a doctor's office? Uh, I'm seeing this guy, uh, let's call him Dr. Shrink. Now I know shrink is not an affectionate term for psychologists and my apologies go out to any mental health professionals in the audience. But I didn't like this guy, so I'm going to call him Dr. Shrink. I said, hi, I'm Ira. Dr. Shrink looked down at me, looked at my parents, and then said, I regret to inform you that your child has 
PDDNOS, pervasive developmental disorder not otherwise specified. So basically what he was saying was, I don't know what your kid has, so I'm gonna call him something nonspecific, even though my parents instinctively knew that I was autistic. He has a deficit in theory of mind and is lacking in empathy. That's the same thing, dipshit. <laughs> he will never go to college and will have to spend his entire childhood away from the rest of his peers. That is, unless I could turn things around with my intervention. Bring him into my office once a week and I'll see what I can do. The conference room wasn't open yet. People were congregating in the hallways. So I went over to the hors d'oeuvres table. Mmm, pizza bites. Fancy pizza bites. And then to my left appeared Lydia Brown, an autistic Asian non-binary esquire who regularly campaigns against the abuse of autistic people. How cool is that? I had read Lydia's writing and seen them speak. Lydia is dynamite. They are a bona fide badass and I was hashtag blessed to be in their presence. I was a bit nervous to introduce myself to them though. Hi, I'm Ira, you must be Lydia Brown. Oh, hi. And then they waved hi to me throughout the rest of the event. I took a peek inside the con conference room just to see who was in there. And there I saw her, the executive director of ASAN herself, Julia Bascombe. Julia was busy and I didn't want to bother her. So I went back out into the hallway and mingled with people who weren't as busy. This was an autistic-led event, but there were all kinds of people there. There were people with so many different kinds of disabilities, people in wheelchairs, people with canes, people who use tablets to communicate, people of all different shapes, sizes, and ages. And eventually, Julia approached me and I was able to introduce myself to her. Hi, I'm Ira. It is an honor to meet you. Hi, Ira, nice to meet you. And then I talked to her about what it was like to live in Atlanta. Julia is tall has an incredibly powerful presence, had a support person by her side to keep her on task, Mardi Gras beads to fidget with, and she's the executive director of the biggest autistic-led organization in the country. How cool is that? The intervention Dr. Shrink had me do mainly involved me playing with a dollhouse appropriately. He said that I had inappropriate play skills? Now, how is there an inappropriate way to play with toys? Okay, don't answer that. <laughs> the only reason why I put up with this was so that I could go to Target afterwards and get a Star Wars toy of my choosing that I could play with however I wanted to. But for now, I was stuck here, so do or do not, there is no try. He, I had been at this for about a month, and I was brought in, Dr. Shrink handed me a mother doll and said, Mom is tired, where does mom go? I knew he wanted me to put her in the bedroom, but I put her in the bathroom, because you can fall asleep in a bathroom depending on how long you're in there. <laughs> no, that's not correct, try again. I then put her in the living room, because you can fall asleep on the couch. No, that's not correct, try again. And at this point, I didn't even put her inside the house, I put her on the front porch, because you can pass out drunk on the front porch. <laughs> My mom and dad looked at each other. <laughs> collected me, left, and we never saw Dr. Shrink again. Though, we did have the thought at the back of our minds. What if Dr. Shrink had been right, that I wouldn't have amounted to anything without his intervention? There was no way, the only time would tell, and we were venturing into unknown territory. The conference room was open. Uh, we were seated, served a three-course meal, and the award ceremony went underway, and then remarks were made about the year. Then the floor was opened up for mingling once again. For a formal event, typical social formalities were exceedingly rare. The MC of the event forgot his no card, and even made a quip about it, saying, if you can't be awkward at an autistic event, then where can you be awkward? There was somebody dressed really nicely who was talking while eating, got some food on her shirt, but it was shrugged off like it was completely normal, which I found that relatable. 
there was this couple that was very fashion forward. They were very fun people, very in love, very autistic. And then the worst part of the event came. It ended. Ever since I've been to the ASAN Gala, I've thought about how many other people there had Dr. Shrinks of their own that said that they wouldn't amount to anything. That I'm not sure about. But what I am sure about is that I've done undergraduate research. I'm a writer, a storyteller, a performer. I've started my own student organization. And I'm about to get my college degree. How cool is that? Ira Ivo. So Macy Gallagher is a transfer student and a multi-talented person, a writer, a performer, and also primarily a designer. Um, and they're just starting out here. And the other day, uh, I saw Macy, and very matter-of-factly, Macy's like, I've got to use some of the things I've learned in your classes and other classes. Also, I talk about those things with my mom. I just love that. <laughs> this is Macy Gallagher. My great-grandfather used to be a photographer for NASA. I remember every time I'd visit, I would run up the stairs on all fours, so excited to get to his office, where we would spend hours looking through some of his greatest shots. Then we would head out to the backyard. The telescope was already set up. I swear, out there, I could hear the moon and stars sing to me. I would pick them apart through the lens, searching for new planets or comets or asteroids or something to call my own discovery. Right now, however, I'm searching for other things. I'm standing in my closet, my happy place, my overflowing conglomeration of eclectic shit I'll probably only wear once. Also, the place where I'm currently engaged in a vicious stare down with the corduroy section but it's not letting up. So I shift my gaze to the shears and decide on this red ruffled night robe. Looking at my selection, I reminisce on the countless weekend nights I've spent here making red carpet get-ups and royal dinner outfits with no plans. But tonight, I have plans. I'm going out. It's August of 2019, and I've been invited to a housewarming party. But this isn't just any housewarming party. It's a gay housewarming party. <laughs> the host is an old friend of mine, and we were close at the beginning of high school, but moved apart a bit when he moved away. Tonight is our first time reuniting, and my first time meeting all his new queer and trans friends. Plus, with a party theme like bimbo days and cowboy gays, I know I have to be dressed to the nines. So after a good 200 hours or so of searching through everything I own, I complete my fit with some red leather cowboy boots and this half-ass bedazzled face mask, which I hope to God is enough to hide the nerves evident on my face. You see, at this point, I know I fall under the queer umbrella, but I've never really been in an all-queer space before, and I don't know how or even if I fit in there. Upon arrival, I'm greeted by the only two people I really recognize, the homeowner and Chris, who I haven't really seen or spoken to since middle school, but we've always been friendly. Apparently, we were closer than I remember, because as soon as I walk in the door, Chris takes me on their arm and says, so, you're not straight, right? <laughs> I'm sure they didn't mean it like that, I don't think. You know, most gays are fine with straight people. We just don't want it shoved down our throat. <laughs> I also knew when someone like Chris said straight, they meant cis and straight. So I said no, because I'm not. I knew that much. Then Chris gestures all grand and says, oh, marvelous. <laughs> and
And it might not have been that exact voice, but they did have a slight obsession with late career Carol Channing at the time, and had on more than one occasion told me they had planned on being unmonogamous that day. <laughs> then Chris spun me like the dramatic theater soul they are and said, so, who are you? Well, <laughs> when I was 18, I really realized I was queer. Not for the first time, definitely. It's hard not to realize when growing up in a small southern town. Not when you're in the seventh grade and just trying to eat lunch. But that one group from science class is there and they would never pass an opportunity to call me a dyke or a faggot. And, you know, it wasn't true. I mean, nobody really is those things, not in the way that they meant them. In middle school, all I was was insecure and lonely and trying so hard not to let anyone know how I felt or who I associated with. That who, being my mother, who is now married to my amazing stepmom, or my best friend who knew he was trans at the age of 12. I became an excellent performer before I even joined theater. I wore a costume to appease an audience that didn't care about appeasing me. I had no character in mind, but eventually I wore my costume long enough to convince myself and everyone around me that I was someone I was not. And to be honest, I didn't even know who or what that was because I had always let other people decide that for me. But here I am, standing in the middle of a group of people I don't know, listening to someone who I haven't spoken to in years have shout over the Kesha karaoke <laughs> to ask me who I am? Now, I'm sure this all sounds very dramatic, but keep in mind we're surrounded by queers in muscle suits. <laughs> I think about the mask on my face. I wonder how long it had been since I put it on. I wonder if... I'd be able to recognize myself without it, and I didn't know. So I told Chris, I don't know. Chris looks at me and they say, isn't that so exciting? What? They're beaming at me, and I had no idea why, because no, it was not exciting. It was fucking terrifying. I don't know who I am. I don't know why I've never felt comfortable in my own skin or why I've never felt really close to my friends. And for the second time in my life, I feel like I'm about to have a panic attack wearing fishnets. But then, <laughs> then I feel their hands on my arm. I feel it beyond the point of contact. And they say it's fine. Just do you. You'll find what you're looking for. I felt something then that I hadn't felt since I was seven years old. In the backyard with my gramps, a star atlas and hot chocolate in hand. Looking up at the sky, he'd tell me, if you ever get lost, I recommend heading out there. I'm sure you'll find what you're looking for. Um, I want to take a minute to thank all of the folks uh, involved in making the technology happen tonight because that is a central part of what we're doing. 
And I want to take a minute to thank our volunteer stage manager, Ben Holmes. Uh, ben was there the first time that I met Ryan Crawford. See, last semester, I don't know if you remember this, long time ago, last semester on university camps is pretty much the Wild West. Some people uh, did correspondence courses. Um, they came sometimes, not other times. That we would do a thing where you could watch class like from a camera and hear me talking and then there were speakers that came out of the ceiling and you could talk and ask questions out of these speakers in the ceiling. So they, you, they were like zooming in essentially, right? Some people will do that sometimes. Ryan Crawford tells me at the beginning of the class, I'm never going to come. Uh, that's what I've decided. And we were all like, fine, because what? I don't know. Nobody knew, right? Nobody knew. Well, I thought that'll be the last we ever heard of that person, because nobody's going to be teamsing in or zooming in all the time. But it turns out that Ryan did. Ryan was always there 20 or 30 minutes before class started and was there when I started the thing up, right? And was always, nobody was always there. Ryan was always there. And then you think, well, those people are never going to contribute because they're at home in their pajamas or whatever. And so you can say, does anyone have any questions? And then Ryan, who you will, you're about to find out, has a very authoritative voice, would say, yes, I have a question from the ceiling. And, and Ben was in this class. Ben and I would be like, it's like the voice of God. <laughs> so Ryan says to me, I'm not coming ever. And I'm not coming to the final exam period either. And I was like, what ifs? You, you always are here. You're contributing. Your work is good. Great. So final exam day comes. And uh, this woman is walking around the hall looking maybe confused. And I said, oh, can I help you? Um, are, are you looking for something? And the voice says, no, I'm in this class. <laughs> and Ben and I were like, it's Ryan! <laughs> this is Ryan Crawford. I remember sitting on the couch at the age of four, little legs dangling off, watching Looney Tunes. When all of a sudden my mom steps into my view, she crouches down and she gives me that look. Now, for those of you that weren't raised by a single black mom, that look is a cross between behave yourself or I'm gonna beat your ass. <laughs> she looks over her shoulder and she introduces me to what I believe is going to be the thing that eats me. <laughs> Let me explain. In walks in the biggest, tallest man I have ever seen in my entire life. Shh, don't move. <laughs> now I know what you're thinking, so dramatic. Listen, I could have crawled on top of this man's shoulders, jumped off, and been severely injured. <laughs> the tall man walks up to us with Chinese food and Shrek. I mean, he's got great taste. But he crouches down and he says, hi, I'm Anthony. And I say, ah! Now it's just me and my two sisters. We all had vastly different reactions. Me, uh, but I was curious later. My sister Kendall, curious, leery. My sister Leah, who is he? Get him out of here. She was a Taurus, if you couldn't tell. <laughs> Anthony just smiled, offered us the food, and asked if we wanted to watch Shrek. We ended up watching the entire movie, and we had a blast. By the end of the movie, we were all hanging off of him like the monkey in a barrel toy that you get from Cracker Barrel. It was awesome. We begged our mom to let him come back and hang out with us. Years later, she actually told us that he had been trying to ask her out for months, but she kept saying no because of us. Sorry, mom. <laughs> <laughs> this particular night, he wanted to take her out to dinner in the movies, but she said no. So he shows up in the middle of the night, Chinese food and Shrek, and says, since you can't go to dinner in the movie, I figured I'd bring dinner in the movie to you. Isn't that like so sweet? <laughs> Oh my gosh. He used to do such nice things for my mom. He was always so consistent. My biological dad, he wasn't like that. His name's Marlon. And for a while, when I was growing up as a little kid, he was my father figure. But my mom and dad ended up getting a divorce when I was young because they kind of had differing goals. I mean, for example, my mom wanted to grow in her career, build up her finances, and provide this amazing life for us. And my dad did it. The older and older I got, the farther and farther away he got. I'm a teenager now, teenage angst. And Anthony's been in the house now for a few years. 
Mom and dad went to the courthouse, tied the knot, popped out a few kids. They're cute, I guess. Now he's officially dad. You know, I'd like to think of him like that, but I just couldn't help the nagging thought in the back of my head that I was replacing my real dad, Marlon. And why should I care? I mean, this man didn't even call me on my birthday. You know, Anthony used to get me and my siblings the best gifts growing up. Marlon didn't even know when I got my driver's license. I'll buy you a car, sure. While Anthony is in the passenger seat while I'm dodging this tree and that tree in the parking lot for hours. Marlon didn't even come to my graduation when I invited him. Anthony was the tallest and the loudest there shouting my name. Ryan! Ryan! <laughs> you know, the funny thing about being mad at a dad that leaves you is that he's not around for you to be mad at. So I placed all of my anger onto Anthony. Me and Anthony fought a lot, like a lot. All my fault, nine times out of the 10. You know, me being an annoying teenager, I wanted to see how much I could poke him to see, let's see if you're really gonna stay like you say. I used to try so hard to be petty and to just make him mad. Let's see if I can flick on your authority figure so then you can get into that position and I can tell you I don't have to listen to you. What I did was small and annoying and petty, but our arguments were huge catastrophic, house-shaking. You're gonna watch your mouth talking to me like that. Well, I'm just trying to say, you're gonna get out of my house before you continue to talk to me like that. That's fine, I'll leave then. I don't need to stay here. You left me and my sister. Why should I care if you want me to leave or not? You know, I was so angry at my biological dad that I didn't even realize I was pointing my finger at Anthony. I had hit rock bottom. I drove a wedge between every relationship that I had because in my mind, I didn't deserve those relationships. I didn't deserve to have connections like other people. I was miserable. And I wanted everybody around me to be as miserable as I was. I'm leaving college, passing by 12 Stone Church like I've been doing for years now. But this particular day, I decided to turn in and park. And I just broke down. I cried out of misery, out of anger. And I cried because I knew what I had come to do there that day. In my mind, I was so toxic that if they came too close to me, they'd catch it or something. The only way to protect my family was to leave this earth. In my mind, I was protecting them by deciding to leave. I was the problem in the equation, right? So subtract it. I got out of the car and I started to walk across the bridge. 12 Stone has a nice, giant, beautiful bridge that leads into the church. My plan was simple, walk and then jump. But I started to walk and my feet wouldn't stop moving. I tried to stop my feet from moving, but I ended up standing in front of the first person I saw inside the church, which was the receptionist lady, and I broke down. And I said the three words that saved my life. I need help. I was there at that church all day, missing calls, not answering calls, praying with pastors, praying with worship leaders. And then during the service that night, I was surrounded by all of these beautiful people during C12, praying over me praying that I make a connection with my Heavenly Father, and then in the back, through the lights, a figure looming and tall comes before me. It's my father. He showed up to me in the most beautiful way. He wrapped me up and he told me that everything was gonna be okay. It was in that moment that I realized that I had to let go of all the anger that I was holding on to, if I wanted any chance in fixing my relationship and building one with the person that was standing right in front of me the whole time. And so I did. 
that day, I let go of my anger so I could pursue on. Me and my dad, we're great now. We joke around, our relationship is super goofy. I mean, we argue from here to there, but I mean, it's a father-daughter relationship and I'm still a work in progress. You know, raising kids is never easy. Raising teenage girls is not easy either. There's no playbook to do these things. You just gotta jump in head first. To jump in head first into the lives of three kids that weren't your own. To raise them up to be beautiful, strong, independent black women in the world that we are now. To teach them and instill morals in them and to love them like they're your own. That's something only superheroes can do. That's something Anthony can do and has done. You know, God showed me something so beautiful in that church that day. I may have lost a father, but God allowed my real one to stay. So thank you. Thank you so much, Dad, for staying.